Good morning. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I'd like you to take it out and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. Uh, We return to the series Captive, and we've been talking about that, I've been preaching about that for the last several weeks. Got out of it for a little while for Bible school and for uh, the Costa Rica mission trip, but now we are uh, back in the swing of things and uh, began back into it last week. But it just, I was just thinking of all the things that hold us captive in this world. And there's so many things. And, and, and I was thinking this week about the fact that I've talked about a lot of things that can hold us captive in a negative way. There's a lot of things that can get in our way. There's a lot of things that can keep us from what God wants for our life. Last week I talked about obstacles. How, how obstacles can get in our way from being where God wants us to be. But I was thinking this week about the fact that that we cannot only be captive in a negative way, we can be captive in a, in a good way, in a godly way. So that's what I was focusing on this week as I was studying. And uh, the context for the, <coughs> excuse me, the context for the scripture today in 1 Corinthians, I want to kind of set the stage just a little bit. It was Paul, the Apostle Paul was sending a letter to the church at Corinth. And he had been in Corinth uh, uh, a few years earlier, and he had planted the church there. It was his second missionary journey. Paul had came to the city of Corinth, a a Greek city, and he uh, had planted the church there. The, The people of Corinth were being held captive by many things. Uh, and I'm not talking about the church people. I'm talking about the people of Corinth, like uh, in, in Pleasant Hill. Uh, the, the people of Pleasant Hill can be held captive by certain things. Uh, the people of Pike County, the people of Illinois can be held captive like by your government, things like that. Uh, but, but to be held captive was what I was thinking of. The city of Corinth was, was being held captive. And, and a lot of the things that were holding them captive are the same things that, that hold people captive in the world today, all the way down to your neighborhood. And, and, and the, the thing that was holding them captive was something that really seems like a good thing, but it wasn't. Uh, it, it was called a word that we call today prosperity. Uh, prosperity, how many of you would like to have more stuff and more things and more money? Anybody? Most of us, if we're honest, yeah, we'd say that, yeah, I, I could use a little more money in my, my bank account, and, and I'd like to have a few things and stuff like that that I don't have. Uh, Gary says, I'd like to have a few more decoys in my arsenal, you know. So, so they're all things that, that people want. But the problem is, prosperity always comes with captivity. Prosperity is something that always, if you look in the Bible... If you look in society, if you look at past nations that have fallen, if you look at people's lives who are in ruin, prosperity a lot of times has been the downfall of nations and people. Uh, How many of us know of people who have everything in the world, but they have nothing when it comes to the Lord? How many of you know of people that are being held captive by their prosperity? They have so many things and they can't realize how much they really have. Along with prosperity comes two things that I was thinking about that that related to the city of Corinth. The first thing was immorality. If you look at prosperity, 90% of the time prosperity will bring immorality. And immorality is something that is a broad range of things. and, And a lot of times when we think of immorality, we think about sexual immorality. Would you say that the prosperity in America has brought in a sexually immoral society? Uh, would you say that the people, the, 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 just the, the, the morals of people is what I'm trying to say. The morals of our country, the morals of people in society, the more we have, the worse we get. The more prosperity we have, the more immoral our country becomes. So immorality is part of prosperity 90% of the time. Also, idolatry happens. Idolatry is something that uh, goes along with prosperity so many times. Before we know it, nobody can get enough, have enough, find enough pleasure. All these things start to build up and prosperity brings immorality. It brings idolatry. Well, in the city of Corinth, that, they were no exception. 
You see, they were a, a wealthy city. Uh, the city of Corinth was, was a, a Greek city, and it was a city that prospered much because of its location. They were uh, in an area where a lot of sea travel happened, and a lot of, a lot of sea travelers, would uh, the, sh- the shipsmen and, and, and the captains, they would take their boats, and instead of going around the peninsula, which was about 250 miles all around the island, they would go across the island because it was closer, it was safer, uh, it was less treacherous. So they would take their boats and they would put them on rollers and they'd roll them across and it went right through the city of Corinth. Well, as the merchants traveled through there, much prosperity came to the city. They began to to cash in on, on on that wealth. And the city of Corinth became a prosperous city. But through that, they lost their morality and they lost their their need for God. In fact, they had never found their need for God. They had many gods. And one of the gods that they looked to was a goddess. Uh, and let me get the name right here. I wrote it down because I knew I wouldn't remember it right. Aphrodite. Now, somebody said that. Very good. You get an A for the day if you had that name. The, the goddess Aphrodite. And they would set up a temple to worship this goddess. And this temple was not any normal temple. It was an amazing, uh, um, immaculate temple that they built. And in the temple, it housed women of the night. They were called prophetess and they would go out of an evening out into the city of Corinth and they would prostitute themselves out in the name of this love goddess. Now you think that we've got it bad around here. Can you imagine living in a city like that? Can you imagine when a thousand women would come out of of the evening and go out and in the name of their God, they would go out and they would prostitute themselves out? I mean, that was the wickedness of the city. That was where they were. So Paul had planted a church there. They were the light of that community. But this, this, this church was struggling. They were struggling a whole lot because of all the immorality, all the idolatry, all of the prosperity had weighed in on the church. So the whole book of 1 Corinthians is Paul writing a letter to this church that he had founded on his second missionary journey to try to help them. He was trying to help them. They needed encouragement. They needed strength. And guess what? They even needed a little correction. In fact, they needed a lot of correction. They needed a lot of correction because a lot of the things from the city had infiltrated into the church. In fact, if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, I believe it's in chapter 10, there was was something going on with a man in the church with his mother uh, his, his, his father's mother, which wasn't his, his biological mother, and he was living with her and having a, an affair with her. And it was, says, those things don't even happen out in the, the city. How can they happen in the church? And so Paul was scolding the church on many occasions through these letters. But he did it in love. He did it in such a way because he knew and he was reminding them of the one thing that made the difference in the church. It's the same thing that makes a difference today. It's the same thing that will make a difference in a nation. It's the same thing that will make a difference in a community. And it's the same thing that will make a difference in our church. And it's the same thing that will make a difference in your life. Paul talked about this one thing over and over and over. Paul was talking about it was something that would bind people together. It was something that that should captivate them. And that's where I got that thought of it should captivate them in a positive way. And it was no more, no less than the cross of Jesus Christ. He talked about the cross in 1 Corinthians. You look at it and Paul, here's what happens with Christians' lives. We get saved by the blood of Jesus. We cling to the old rugged cross. And somewhere along the lines, the world infiltrates into our thoughts, into our churches, and we forget that the cross is the one thing that made all the difference. The cross is something that we cling to. The cross, as Lisa said, it's not just the wooden cross. It's the cross of Christ Jesus. You see, there's nothing in this world that should hold you and me and the church more captive as Christians than the cross. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ is the single greatest dividing line in this whole world. You can take the cross of Jesus and there is no middle ground. You have accepted the cross of Calvary or you have rejected it. It is the dividing line for everything in our world. 
It is the single greatest event, as Lisa said. And I'm glad you pointed that out. That was a good point. The eclipse of the sun was God's power on display on that day at Calvary when Jesus was dying on the cross for our sins. He was bleeding. He was suffering. He was dying for us. And the whole world, not just a path down the middle of the United States, the whole world went dark. Darkness seemed to have prevailed. Darkness seemed to have won. Satan seemed like he had the upper hand, but little did he know that the cross of Jesus was God's way of demonstrating his power, his love, his forgiveness to you and I in a way that the world has never seen before. Today, that same cross of Jesus is something we must never get over. It must be something that every day it affects our life. Everything we say, everything we think, everywhere we go, everything we do, it should affect our lives in such a way that it becomes part of us in a way that people can see. In our scripture today, and i got to get into the message because I'm preaching, I haven't even got to the message yet. It, it, the cross of Jesus is a message. It sends a message. It sends a clear message. It sends a perfect message. It sends a Christ-like message. It sends the message from God. The cross of Jesus is what Paul was talking about here in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians, when he wrote the letter to the Corinthian church. Let's all stand. Let's read this together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 17, here's what Paul tells the church that he had planted. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be should, should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us, to us we are being saved, who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through the wisdom did not know God, it pleased God to the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jesus, excuse me, for Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we, we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let us pray. Most holy God, we come before you at this time. I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this word. I thank you that Paul loved the church enough to write them this letter, not only helping them and encouraging them, but correcting them and scolding them at times, God, when they needed correction, Lord. And Father God, your word speaks volumes to us today. Father, help us to never get over the cross of Jesus Christ. The message that it carries, Lord, that we would carry this message to the world. Father, we thank you that we unite today in the name of Jesus. If there's someone here today that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, someone within the sound of my voice, I pray, God, that they would repent and bow on their knees before you, God, and beg for Jesus to come into their life. Father, we know that Jesus, your, Savior, your Son and our Savior, He is the one. The message of the cross speaks to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So today, for these next few minutes, I want to look at this passage of Scripture. And we're going to focus in on verses 17 and 18 today. We're probably not going to talk much past that because I don't have enough time to go into all the depths of this. We'll probably do that on Wednesday night a little bit more, but I can tell you this. There's enough in verse 17 and 18 to change a lost soul's heart. There's enough in verses 17 and 18 to make a believer live stronger for Jesus. There's enough today to convince us that we have a message that we need to be carrying to the world. What is this message? 
What is this message of the cross? Well, first of all, plain and simple, this message of the cross that Paul speaks of here is the gospel that we preach. It's the gospel that we preach. Paul understood who he was. I think a lot of times Christians forget their identity is not in this world. It's not in your job. It's not in how much you have. It's not in how hard this world can be. It is in the name of Jesus Christ. See, Paul understood that full well. He understood who he was in Jesus Christ. He was forgiven. He was redeemed. He was bought by the blood of Jesus. He understood the cross and the meaning of that. And I fear that in churches today, we've lost the understanding and the significance of the day that Jesus died for us. Paul understood who he was and he understood his mission in life. Paul says in verse 17... For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That says it all right there. Paul could sum up why he did what he did, why he he was who he was, who he felt he needed to reach out to, why he was not concerned about the things of this world. Paul said, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He was sent by God. I think we've forgotten Are you a born-again believer in Jesus Christ? Say amen. Amen. God has sent you not to baptize, not to play church, not to pretend everything's okay, not to tell everybody that you need to be in church, but you do, but to preach the gospel. When Paul was saying this, he was not talking about just the preachers. The preachers are expected to preach the gospel. I will always preach the gospel. But he was telling them, I did not come to show you how to baptize people. I showed you how to preach the gospel. You want to see a world change for Jesus? Preach the gospel to the world. We've forgotten in our churches that we are sent people. God has sent us out into the world. The Great Commission is not a great suggestion. When Jesus says, I give you all the authority and the power and everything you need, you go out into the world and you baptize after they have received Christ. And you teach them, and you tell them, and you show them that they have a message too. You see, I think the Great Commission is not reserved for just Paul or just the preachers or the deacons or something like that. The Great Commission was given to every believer in Jesus Christ. When's the last time that you went out and preached the gospel to someone? I love it. I had a great conversation with Stephanie and Phil this morning, and they were talking about their kids, and there's great things going on with their kids. I won't share all of it with you right now, but I will share this. You remember Riley got saved at, at Bible school. And they said, we cannot help but our kids go out and they tell everybody, I I have Jesus in my heart. I belong to Jesus. They are gospel preaching, what, eight, nine, ten year old kids. Unashamed of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I believe it, maybe it's verse 8, verse 16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. If you're not ashamed of it, why aren't you telling it? Paul was a sent man, he was sent to preach the gospel. Not to quarrel, not to have a popularity contest, not to cause division, but to preach the gospel. Why do I say those three things? It's because in verses 11 through 16, that's what he addresses. He says, I didn't come to cause contentions. I don't want to cause quarrels. We don't need quarreling in the church. We need the gospel. He said, I wish that I had not baptized anybody because people in the church are saying, well, I was baptized by Paul and I was baptized by Cephas and I was baptized by Jesus. Paul says, I wish that I hadn't baptized anybody. You know what that is? That's a hang up. People get hung up on things in church and they forget it's not about baptism. It's not about this. It's not about that. It's about the gospel. And proclaiming and being sent by God To preach the gospel. The gospel is the good news. How many of you need some good news today? You don't have to open the Bible very far to see. Yeah, there's bad things. There's hard things. There's people who mess up. But it's about the gospel. Everything points back to the fact that Jesus died on the cross. And that is our gospel message. He died for all of us. 
That's the most positive thing that I can think of that anyone could ever hear. That's the most life-changing message that you could ever speak. And the Bible points to it in every direction. What is the message of the cross? It's the gospel that we are to preach. Next thing I want you to understand, it's not only the gospel that we preach. Paul says it's foolishness to the lost. It's foolishness to the lost. Now that word foolishness, if you ever do word studies in the Bible, you kind of uncover some pretty cool things. And as I was doing the word study of of what I was getting ready to preach on, that word foolishness in the Greek means, uh, the the word is moriah, M-O-R-I-A. And you know the word moriah is where we in the English get our word moron. Foolishness, moron. Which do you like better? Somebody who does not accept Jesus. They're not a fool. They're a moron, right? Now everybody's going to be mad at me. I'm just saying the Greek word and telling you what it means. Have you ever seen a moron? Don't look around now, guys. Come on. Have you ever seen a moron? I know Daryl. Look straight ahead there, okay? Because he was smiling at me when I, when I said that. Bonnie? You need to be looking at him. I can tell you that, yes. You you know, I have a good illustration of this. When you drive down the highway, you're driving down the highway, there's two kinds of people out on the road. You're driving down the highway, and there's somebody who gets up on your tail and tries to go around you and ride your bumper. Somebody like people I know. That'll give me too much trouble. And like they whip around you, they, they pass you on a corner, they act like they have somewhere to go and they probably don't have anywhere to go. And that person you call a maniac, right? And then there's those people that putter along. And they drive so slow, it drives you crazy. You ever been behind somebody like that? Like, come on, I don't have all day. Why are you just driving the speed limit? We got to get out of here, right? And they're driving down the road slow. And you look at that person, and the person driving too fast is labeled a maniac, and the person driving too slow is labeled a moron, right? So there's two types of people on the road, maniacs and morons, right? Everybody's a maniac or a moron except for me. I drive perfectly, right? That's what we think, right? We see Paul classified a moron as someone who looked at the gospel, heard the gospel, and they thought it was foolishness. Do you know anybody that thinks the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross is foolishness? Do you know anybody like that? That's okay, because I know people like that too. And you look at them and you can say, how how moronic is that? But your heart has to break for them because they can't see it. It's as plain as the nose on your face. I was talking with Merle yesterday, Merle Hallen. I know Merle's not here this morning, so I can't pick on him. But Merle and I was talking, and we was talking about when he got saved. It's amazing how when you get saved, radically saved, that's all you talk about, right? And Merle talks about getting saved, how it changed his life. And Merle was talking about, he remembered when he got saved, it was like the floodgates opened up, and he understood things like he never understood before. He said, it was right in front of me the whole time. I had Christians around me. I had things going on around me that God was trying to show me. And I believed in God. But I did not accept the cross of Jesus. And, but when I did, it just all made sense to me. Is that your story? And he says, now I look at people who are not believers, who can't understand what I know, and I think they think that it's foolishness for us to be doing this. Why in the world would you meet up there on a the hill and come together and give your money and, and give your time and give all of your resources to something as foolish as that. And the truth be known until they see the cross of Jesus and the message for them, they will think that it's foolish. You know, we have people like that in our lives, don't we? You may have a family member that thinks it's foolish. You may have a friend that thinks it's foolish. You may have co-workers that think it's foolish. The truth be known, people have thought it was foolish ever since the day of Paul. You know what the saddest thing on earth is? Well, maybe not the saddest thing on earth, but the saddest thing when it comes to Jesus. Those who think others are fools 
when it's actually them. Someday they will stand before God and they will realize that the cross was the difference. The message was real. That God did send His Son to die. And the foolishness will go away. And the reality will be there. You see, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's what it says in verse 18. Do we understand the word perish, what that really means? You know, when I think of perish, I think about my refrigerator at home. I go home, I open the refrigerator up, and I look in, and I say, Ooh, I haven't seen that container for a while. I wonder what's in that thing. You ever done that? And you think, do I take a chance on opening up a, a cottage cheese container with a sour cream lid... Or do I just throw it away? And so I pull it out of the refrigerator and I look at it. And you know, curiosity gets the preacher every time. He's got to look at it. What's inside it? What's inside it? And you open it up and oh my gosh, look at that. It's got green hair growing all over it. It it looks like it was something at one time, but it's, it's not much of anything right now. It is perishing. It has perished. It's no good. I remember one time my son came home and he went in and he got out a bunch of roast beef that was in the refrigerator and he got it out and he's eating a big sandwich and and Lisa comes in, Eric, I didn't know that was in there. That's like a month old. And he's like, well, it tastes pretty good to me, you know, but that was in his teenage days and he had an iron gut. He still got an iron gut. But the truth be known, I think our idea of perish when we see that in the Bible is way too shallow. You see, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. It doesn't mean their shelf life is about to expire. It doesn't mean that they're getting a little stale. It doesn't mean that they're a little over over ripe. It means that they're headed towards death and destruction, separation from God. It means that someday, someday, without the message of the cross, them accepting that, that they will be cast into the lake of fire forever, as the Bible says. to eternal destruction and damnation. You know, sometimes I think as believers, we look at people and we think, well, they're just a little spoiled or a little rotten. They are destined to perish from God forever. Paul understood this. It may be foolishness to them, but they need the message. Next thing, i got to keep moving. What is the message of the cross? It's the gospel we preach. It's foolishness to the lost. But it's also, it's the salvation in Jesus. Point blank. It's the salvation in Jesus. In verse 18, he says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, dying, going to be separated from God forever. But to us, to us, us as believers, us as Christians, us as the church of God, who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's our salvation to us, 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 us Bible thumpers, us holy rollers, us believers in Jesus, to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. You know, when you ever look at the verbiage in Scripture and, and say, you know what, I need to understand that. How many of you that are saved by Jesus would say that you are being saved? If I would say that, have you been saved or are you say are you being saved? They say, "Well, I gave my life to Christ on August twentieth, two thousand seventeen. Praise God." Well, then, how does Paul say that for those who are being saved by Jesus? Well, some of you know this, but some of you don't. So you're going to learn something today. Your salvation is threefold. There's the moment that you decide that the cross is not foolishness, it is salvation, and you give it all to God, and you pray and receive Jesus. And at that moment, you have been saved. If you would die after that second moment in time, you would go to heaven to be with Jesus. There's nothing that can take that away. There's nothing, no power on earth can ever take that away. You can't be bad enough, you can't be good enough, You're in the hands of Jesus. I have been saved. That means I have been justified by Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross and I accept that, it's just as if I hadn't sinned. 
When I accept Him, my sins are not covered. My sins are taken away by the blood of Jesus. I have been saved. Paul says, you are being saved. Well, yeah, I am being saved in the process of it right now. What does that mean? Not justification, not the point of salvation. It means that God is making me more like Jesus, more like Christ. And I, through this life, no matter how hard I try, no matter how, hard, how far I get, I will still have a long ways to go. And that's called sanctification. I know these big words, we say them in churches, and you're like, what is justification? What is sanctification? Justification, it means that Jesus died in my place, and I now belong to Him. Sanctification is God's process of us becoming more like Christ on this earth as we live our lives. The sanctification process is where we're at right now as believers. We need to be coming more like Jesus every day. I am being saved. Who are being saved at this point. But someday we're all going to die. Did you know that? Someday we will leave this earth. And when we do, or when Jesus comes back, and I, I would like that option there. If I could pick A or B, I'd pick B when Jesus comes back. When we die or when Jesus Actually, it's when Jesus comes back, because when we die, we wait for Jesus to come back. Okay, I'm going to confuse everybody now. Let me get out of this. I'm digging a hole here. When Jesus comes back, you will be saved. I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. What do I mean by that? I will receive my glorified body, and God will glorify me in heaven. What does that mean? That means I don't have to fight the things of this world anymore. I don't have to worry about sin anymore because there will be no sin in heaven. I don't have to worry about temptation. I don't have to worry about the devil. I don't have to worry about paying my taxes. I don't have to worry about all the problems because I have been glorified and I will receive my perfect body and I will be with Jesus forevermore. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I have been saved. I am being saved, as Paul said here, and I will be saved someday. God is saving us from this earth. I don't want to live on this earth forever. You know why? Because I want to be glorified. I want to have that glorified body and praise God forevermore someday. To be delivered from the sin and the fallen world. Last thing here, I've got to get this in. What is the message of the cross? Well, Paul says it's the gospel we preach. It's foolishness to the lost. It's our salvation in Jesus. But finally, as he says there at the end, it is the power of God. The power of God. Now, I guess this is pick on Eric Day because I thought of this earlier. So pay attention, Eric. My son works for Ameren Power Company, Ameren Power Supply. So I will give you his phone number, and if you have a power outage in the middle of the night, you call Eric and he'll take care of it. I do that. I give him a hard time. You see, Eric represents Ameren, but he's not the power source. He just represents Ameren. Eric can help fix the problem, but he cannot completely solve the problem on his own. Eric would be foolish to think that Ameren's whole corporation rests on my shoulders, on his shoulders. That without him, nothing would happen. He's so indispensable that if he quit Ameren, the whole company would fold up. I don't think he's quite that conceited yet. He's not. I'm kidding. But the truth be known, Eric understands. He is part of the conduit to get power to your lives. You get it? He helps solve the problems. He is part of the solution, but he cannot fix that on his own. He has to rely on something much greater than him in order for this to happen. And believe me, my son takes great pride in being at a substation when there's 100,000 volts of electricity coming through a line and he's throwing the breaker and it goes like that and it looks like, you know, some science fiction movie. And he records that and he sends it to his mama to scare her to death and his wife probably too. Look what I did today. Like that 100,000 volts coming through because he pulled a lever. But he didn't create the power, did he? He had nothing to do with that. All he had to do was he pulled the lever so the power would go on. Paul understood as a believer in Christ, even though he knew Jesus as his Savior, 
even though God let him write all, so many books of the New Testament, even though he had a great education, even though he was all that to so many people, he knew really the power didn't rest in him. It was from God. It would be foolish for me as a preacher to stand up here and say, you know what, the power of God is in me and I can give that to you if you come forward. and You give me 50 bucks and I'll give it to you. I understand that all I am is just part of the conduit that lets God's power flow through me. I really don't have anything to do with it. I just have to be faithful. Say, God, use me, flow through me in the same way that you do. That's not just for a preacher. It's anybody who's living within the power of God. And what happens is we throw it off circuit because we forget about the cross. We forget about why we're here. We forget about foolish people who need Jesus. And we think the sun rises and sets and the eclipse tomorrow has to do with us. I was thinking about the eclipse, as Lisa mentioned, tomorrow. Do you know the eclipse is a demonstration of the sun being removed from this earth? From being, that's not the right word I want, disappearing from this world. The sun disappearing and reappearing. And we look at that as, like Lisa said, we'll spend money, we'll travel, we'll go, we'll look, we'll spend time, we'll focus on it. Because, wow, this is a once-in-a-lifetime event. And the truth be known, 2,000 years ago, the sun didn't disappear, the sun died. And when the sun died on the cross, there was an eclipse of the whole world in darkness. But the message of the cross didn't end at the cross, did it? Jesus didn't disappear. Jesus died. They laid him in a tomb. And three days later, the sun appeared. And because of that, there is no power in this world greater than God. Through his son, Jesus. You know, some of you are here today and some of you are listening to this right now. And you think, so this message of the cross, so what? What? What does that mean for me? How do I apply this to my life? Well, let me just say this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're saved by the blood of Jesus, if Jesus' death on the cross means everything to you like it should, then you are sent by God to preach the gospel. How long has it been since you've done that? You know, when you go, some people are going to think it's foolish. Why? Because Paul said so. Because Jesus said so. Because the Bible shows us it is foolishness to some. Maybe today somebody's listening, somebody's paying attention to what's being said. And somebody's ready. Ready to say, you know what, God, I have believed in you, I thought about you, I, I believe in Jesus, I've been to church, but I've never realized the message of the cross, and it makes sense to me now. You're ready. You're ready to stop doing it your way and start doing it God's way. And finally, the message of the cross, it's the power of God. And some of us believers today, you haven't been living within the power of God. And, and you wonder why things are so hard and you're about ready to give up. And you're dealing with something that is bigger than you. And you're trying to overcome something, maybe an addiction or something in your life or a problem. You're trying to press on. And the message today says this. The cross of Jesus is exactly what you need in your life right now. You need to claim it. You need to believe it. And you need to cling to Jesus today. You're going to have an opportunity to do that here in just a moment at invitation. God has spoken to many people today, here, there, everywhere. The cross, that's the message. God demonstrated His love. But while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the lost for the sun.
pray. Father, we come to you today and we thank you, God. Thank you for the old rugged cross. And Lord, help us not just to sing about it. Help us not just to think about it. Help us to remember the one who died on that cross. Help us, God, today to focus on Jesus. Jesus, you're the reason why we're here. We believe that everything begins and ends in you. Lord, I pray for the lost today, those who think the message is foolish, that they would turn to Jesus today. Open their eyes, open their heart, and see Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Father, for the believers here today who may be struggling or, or just tired and weary or, or trying to face things in their life, and, 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 and they believe in you, God, and they know you're, you're the Savior through your Son, Jesus, but they just need to give it to you today. They need to make the connection and let that power into their life. Father, I know I've done that in my life. I've tried to do it on my own. And God, when I open up and just be a conduit of your power, what mighty things I see. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.